Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, here's the question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here, back with the final update for Phase 2 of the Speculative Evolution Project. This is it. The next video for this project is going to be the intro for Phase 3 that tells you what has happened between Phases 2 and 3, and how to submit your very own Phase 3 creatures. Well, before we get into it, I want to remind you to please like this video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, hit the notification bell so you always know when there's more Dapper Dino content, and share this video. This has been a rough time for a number of content creators in terms of channel growth, myself included, and it really means a lot if you can like this video and share it with your friends. Anyway, let's get into the creatures. First up is Chiropaz. The minuscule Chiropaz seen here near Yerpresi is, despite its adorable appearance, a voracious predator of anything it can get its limbs around. Creature designed by Lewis Corbett. Vortulex is a genus of small predators well adapted to grasping prey with their legs which have evolved to serve as talons, delivering a venomous sting. Descended from basal pseudotetrapods like Bowbird, they have elongated the posterior breathing apparatus to serve as a propulsive tail, which beats upwards and downwards rapidly in a cetacean-like form of swimming, an efficient way of increasing the rate of gas exchange in order to fulfill the energetic needs of such aggressive locomotion, although they still spend much time walking. Their more delicate areas are covered by a rubbery armor, not completely solid, but tough enough to give them some protection in the increasingly competitive marine environments of al -Maisha. They retain all the biological and anatomical features of their ancestors, except with an added larval stage that forms part of Almaisha's zooplankton community during the first few days of life. Vortulex is a hermaphroditic organism with four paired gonads all connected to the cloaca. The anterior pair produces female gametes and the posterior male gametes. Many occurs with a dominant partner laying eggs that are then externally fertilized. Dominance is established by a wrestling match. After hatching, a chiropaz has a planktonic larval stage. In this state, they feed on their fellow zooplankton, as well as on phytoplankton, only committing to strict carnivory after settling in the shallows. Chiropaz will eat just about any fauna it can get its limbs around, and envenom with its claws. Mostly this is small worms that burrow through the substrate, but it will also take juvenile members of much larger species, such as young rock fruit. Chiropaz live along the western and southern coasts of Natash, all the coasts of Ras el Kalb, and all but the northern coasts of Chatang. The eyes are more acute than those of Bobird, although still not exceptional. While the chemoreceptive antennae are short, they are also very sensitive and are one of the main ways that Chiropaz finds their prey. Genetic ancestors? Bobird. Scientific name? Vortulex citrinus. Origin? Pseudotetrapoda. Lifespan? 2-4 to four local years. Average length? 2.6 centimeters. Next up is the high stem. Pictured here, a few high stems preparing for the reproductive event by getting as much sunlight as possible. Creature design by Zord. For much of its life, a high stem looks like an ancestral bossio, but with a thicker stalk. They have a rhizoid and a single circle shaped photosynthetic structure on top of each stalk. The stalk, however, slowly builds up gas, which begins to make it float. This floating is an integral part of the organism's life cycle. Another interesting aspect is that the stalk develops a small bulb at the center of the leaf. This will burst during the final stage of the reproductive event, and is essentially a valve that will let internal gas and gametes be expelled. After spending some time at the surface, it will expel reproductive cells from its reproductive tube and bulb. After doing so, it will also have expelled all its buoyant gas. This is time to happen at around the local vernal equinox, and the gametes will then float in the water, hopefully to combine with the gametes of other high stems. Then the new seed will sink to the bottom, and if there is enough light, grow. A high stem stand starts as a single fertilized seed. This settles to the bottom of the sea, and if there is enough light, it will send up a small stalk and begin growing a rhizoid root system. Just like Basio, it will send up new stalks from the rhizoid if there is enough light. At this point, gas begins to build up in the largest stalks, and about 10 days before the vernal equinox, the largest stalks will float up to the surface. Over the next 10 local days, the highest stalks will use the extra sunlight from being at the surface to go into a frenzy of production of gametes, which culminates in the release of the gametes and the gas in the stalk, causing the now dead stalks to sink to the bottom, fertilizing the area, and letting their gametes combine in a rather spectacular event of broadcast spawning. A single stalk can release tens of thousands of gametes, although nearly all of them will fail to produce a new stand. The original stand often does not make it much past its first release of stalks from the rhizoid. With greatly diminished photosynthetic capacity, it is less able to make up for losses due to herbivores. But if it does survive, it may then continue to reproduce for several years. 
High stems are an occasional sight just about anywhere that the water is shallow enough to allow for photosynthesis. They are not overly tolerant of cold, so they are uncommon near Arctica, and the frigid water near the northern ice cap kill any high stems that float into the region or that attempt to grow there. Genetic ancestor? Basio. Scientific name? Radixelsis supernatet. Origin? Retinal phyto. Now we come to the mycoid. Mycoids are minuscule decomposers who feed on virtually any organic material that has died and drifted to the ocean floor. While they can still photosynthesize, mycoids gain very little to none of their food this way. Creature design by Dapper Dino. The anatomy of mycoids is radically reduced from their phytozoan ancestors. The tendrils are reduced to just two, set on opposite sides of the body. There are no eye spots, and other than some simple angular muscles and a thin layer of photosynthetic cells, most of the organism is just an open sack of fluid that diffuses oxygen and nutrients around. The only major innovation is several thousand cilia, which conduct external digestion of dead matter, the results of which are also then taken into the organism via diffusion. This may not be as efficient as internal digestion, but the enzymes and acids used by mycoids are well adapted to rapidly breaking down dead tissue. Mycoids reproduce by fission. When they reach about 6 mm in total length, a cleft will develop in the middle of their body. Eventually this will split into two, approximately 3 mm organisms, who will then go on their way growing. Their ancestors are hypothesized to have still mated, but at this point even their gonads have atrophied to non-existence. Mycoids are a major decomposer, and also help seed the substrate with valuable nutrients like nitrates and phosphates. These organisms can be found anywhere other organisms die, and so have a virtually worldwide distribution in the ancient oceans of Almaisha. Genetic ancestor? Cecilia. Scientific name? Mycozoan elegans. Origin? Phytozoa. Average length? 4.5 millimeters. Radiodomes are a form of radio predator from ancient Almaisha's ocean depths. They are mostly sessile, but communicate together in colonies to direct the growth of the whole patch, for the benefit of the whole, mostly, clonal group. They will also catch the occasional feather bush that may swim by with their silicate barbs. Radar domes also use these to defend themselves from radar raptors. They have the same tools as those, but can better detect the position of the raptor. When the raptor attacks the radar domes, the radar domes will attack back. Frequently, they win beta-voltaic cells and the accompanying genetic material. Creature Design by Dr. Bob Smith Radio domes have a minimum of three beta-voltaic cells. Older ones may have dozens. They vary in size from 10 centimeters to several meters in diameter. They resemble large fractal trees that may or may not have attached to the sea bottom. Radio predators evolved two new types of specialized stems. The first is a tool. For example, some are thin and coated with coarse silicate. These work as saws. Others are stout and terminate in a hard alloy tip. These stems cut apart fractal trees. The second doesn't grow beta-voltaic cells, but will allow new ones to be grafted on. They also have a root-lined pouch that is analogous to the structure in a stomach. This surrounds the stalk leading to the dome. The radiodome life cycle starts when they break off from their parent and swim away. They will have two or more beta-voltaic cell leaves attached to four stems. When they consume other radiotrophic life forms, they may integrate genetic material from their prey, allowing them to maintain genetic diversity despite their asexual mode of reproduction. The larval stage of a tree is a pair of leaves searching for a new source of radiation. The detached leaves use their electric charge to whip their stem. This powers them through the water. The time to reach maturity depends on the resources where the larva settles. It can take anything from a few months to centuries. Radiodomes have three significant organs associated with their sensory perception. Radiation detectors. These are natural scintillators. They are composed of phosphor-laden potassium iodide and a screen of silicon photoreceptors. The detectors are housed within a glass-filled bladder and connect to the creature by a long stem, giving the creatures their common names. Network connection. The roots of individual radar domes connect to each other. This allows messages to be broadcast to the forest. They are analogous to neurons in a simple brain. Gateways. These pass signals sent on the network connections to other network connections. They also target stems within the body of the plant. They are analogous to synapses in the brain. Genetic ancestor? Fractal tree. Scientific name? Radioarborus cyclos. Origin? Radiotropha. Now we come to the related radioraptor. Radioraptors are vicious predators of the radioactive water near rifts in the crust of the oceanic plates of ancient Almaisha. They can sense electrical impulses in other creatures, and while their favorite prey is other radiotrophs, they are not at all opposed to eating other creatures such as sleeping fish. Creature design by Dr. Bob Smith. Instead of roots that dig into the sea bottom like their ancestors and cousins, a long web of roots stream behind the swimming predators. They also have radiation detectors, but the individual detectors are much smaller. Scientists theorize their reduced size is because of water resistance. Because they don't connect to other raptors, they must triangulate to find nutrients. They have barb-filled tendrils and jaws studded with metal-rich tooth-like structures. Reproduction is done by budding from the posterior tips of the tendrils. When radioraptors consume other radiotrophic life, they may incorporate genetic material from their prey, 
allowing them to maintain genetic diversity, despite their asexual mode of reproduction. As the tendrils grow from behind a radioraptor, they will eventually have 12 tips, which themselves contain three beta-voltaic cells. Eventually, these will break off into a new individual, and then regrow. The new larva will grow two tendrils at the front and back, and begin swimming. The back pair of tendrils will split ventrodorsally into four, and from there they will continue to grow and split distally. During this time, the jaws will also begin to develop, and the creature will become more and more active as a predator. Radioraptors are voracious predators of primarily other radiotrophs, but they also gain some energy from ambient radiation, and will also absorb some important minerals directly from the water. The radiation and electrical sensory abilities of radioraptors are not terribly precise, but it is more than adequate for them to sink their metal-laden teeth into their prey, even being able to take down radiodome stalks. Genetic ancestor? Fractal tree. Scientific name? Radiopiscus Assurians. Origin? Radiotropha. Next up, we have reef crowns. Reef crowns are sessile filter-feeding stephanozoans, but rather than primarily growing on rocks, they tend to build upon each other's skeletons, forming small reefs. Four reef crowns are pictured here, resting. Creature design? By Dapper Dino. Adult reef crown anatomy is very similar to rose crown anatomy, except that in the transition from the larval stage to the adult stage, the mode of tentacles are lost. They are also significantly larger, coming in at about one centimeter from the mouth to the aboral tip of the creature. Another major departure is that the reef crown secretes calcium carbonate, CaCO3. This builds up into a tube over time and provides a holdfast for younger reef crowns. Reef crowns have two sexes and engage in broadcast spawning on full moons. After fertilization and initial embryonic development, a larval reef crown will look more or less the same as an adult rose crown. It will grow until it is about half a centimeter long, gaining more in length than in circumference. At this point, it will be large enough to overcome the currents and will swim down to find a final holdfast, preferring a substrate of calcium carbonate. Reef crowns are filter feeders. They live in tropical shallow waters worldwide. Reef crowns are very sensitive to touch, but lacking even the most rudimentary brain, they have no ability to hear or form images with any eyes. They are photosensitive, which helps them regulate their circadian rhythms, though. This photosensitivity is absent any particular eye spots. The whole body has low levels of photosensitivity, and when photons in the peak spectrum of Adib hit any cells, they release a hormone. The daily cycle of hormone release regulates their circadian rhythm. All the tentacles are also chemoreceptive and will shift towards the scent of food. Genetic ancestor? Rose crown. Scientific name? Ephalostephanus anapyros. Origin? Stephanozoa. Lifespan? Two local years. Average length, one centimeter. And now, after all these many months, we finally come to the final creature for phase two of the Speculative Evolution Project, the Streozol. The Streozol is an ambush predator that uses its highly modified rearmost appendages to launch into short bursts of speed through the water to grab prey. Pictured here, a Streozol has captured a Upressi. Creature design by Space Dragon. Similar to their Diomisa ancestors, the Streozol possess two body sections. On the first, the four tentacles have all shifted to more directly surround the mouth opening, which has also shifted forward towards the front of the tagma. Additionally, the tentacles have each had their ends split, forming two smaller tentacles. The chemoreceptors and sensory receptors along the tentacles are concentrated onto the split ends, with the chemoreceptors primarily around the tips of each. The tentacles have also developed a single row of small, cutting teeth along the innermost edge. The light-sensitive receptors have developed further into eyes. One pair has shifted to the ventral side of the tagma, while the other pairs have remained facing upwards. Along the top of the head are three interconnected armored plates, with an indentation between the first and second plates for the eyes facing upwards. On the second tagma, the first three limbs remain fairly similar to those of their ancestors, being columnar in shape, and moved through a system of blood pumping through them. The fourth limb, however, has adapted to point directly backwards, and are developed to be large panels that can be used to propel the strails all through the water faster than they can walk for a short period. The upper part of the body is akin to the first section. It has a series of five interconnected armor plates, with the sections between them located above each of the pairs of limbs. The four pairs of spiracles have moved to be closer together and have shifted more towards the ventral side of the creature. Due to the increased complexity of both the eyes and the appendages, the brain has also increased in size. The mouth inside the opening between the four appendages is lined with ridges made of material similar to the one that makes up the plates of armor on the Streozol's back. It uses these to masticate its food before passing on the ground-up particles to the Streozol's stomach. The stomach itself, aside from enlarging, has not changed much, and it is still emptied by regurgitating a pellet of waste. The chamber that produces the gametes has additionally not changed much, aside from the connections to the mouth being located closer to the entrance of the mouth. In the second tagma, the interior gills have increased in size somewhat and now take up a significant part of the upper region of the segment. They are still assisted in moving water in and out of them by the movement of legs and paddles. 
Additionally, their circulatory system has become closed, with four simple hearts keeping the blood moving, again assisted by the movements of the legs and paddles. The Straozole method of reproduction has remained largely unchanged from their Diomisa ancestors, still consisting of broadcast spawning, releasing thousands of gametes into the water during each mating season. Their larvae still become part of the zooplankton, but grow larger more quickly than their ancestors did. Straozole eat anything they come across that is small enough to eat. Their diet consists primarily of other animals, but they will eat plants if necessary. They use their tentacles to grab onto their food, and if necessary, they use small teeth on their insides to cut and tear into smaller pieces. They then place the food into their mouth, where it is ground up and swallowed. They are primarily ambush predators, capable of brief bursts of speed. Strayozol are found mostly along the eastern coasts of Natash, as well as the northern and western coasts of Ras al Kalb. The eyes of Strayozol are more advanced than those of their ancestors, and are capable of sensing light and seeing stationary creatures and objects a few meters away from it, and moving creatures out to about a dozen meters. Genetic ancestor, Diomisa. Scientific name, Straozole arti. Origin, Paleotagmata. Lifespan, 9 local years. Average height, 9 centimeters. Average length, 30.5 centimeters. Well, that's it for phase 2. It's done. It took months, a lot longer than I thought, and we had way more submissions than I thought we did. Last I counted, we were at about 50, although I'm not positive about that number, and I was expecting maybe 20 max. The planning for Phase 3 is well underway. I have plans about what's going to shift with the geography, the climate. There will be extinctions, as you already know. There will also be a template and a style guideline, which will help keep all the submissions consistent and help me go through which ones will be accepted and which ones won't. Now, do be aware that this means that if you do not follow the style guidelines or the template, it will automatically mean that your creature has been rejected. You may resubmit it after following those guidelines, however. I'm not sure exactly how long submissions will be open. I'll determine that by the time Phase 3 comes out, but I'm thinking somewhere around two months. Well, that's all for me for now, and like I said, remember to subscribe and like the video. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Hovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. Their support helps make this channel possible, because as you may know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and they give this channel much-needed additional stability. If you'd like to join the team, a link to my Patreon page can be found in the description, and you can join with the button right below this video on YouTube. Both groups of people get access to my special patron and member-only Discord channel, links to new videos before I release them to the public, as well as a pretty direct line to me. They also often are asked to do things like vote on new video topics. If a monthly subscription isn't something that you'd like to do, but you'd still like to help out the channel, I also have a Teespring store that has Dapper Dino merch, including mugs, blankets, pillowcases, shirts, all sorts of things. And if none of those things are for you, then please just remember to like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and share the video. All of those things really do help the channel grow. Well, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur.